Preet here in a minute. By the way, right there. I turned it on. We're getting good. We're working well, Lana. But our, uh, our own Lana Yule is going to be speaking to us here in a little bit, and then I'll come behind it and uh, see if the Lord would give me a tiny bit to add to. Uh, there's not a lot to be added to what she is about to share, but it will, of course, be from the Word of God. Celebration of Life Sunday. What does that mean? Uh, we jumped in on this a number of years ago. There was a young lady by the name of Michelle Dobson who used to serve at formerly Rachel House, of course, now Resource Health. And I reached out and I said, you know, I'd love to be a little bit more involved in some of the mission work locally in this area. And one of them that really hits me is uh, Rachel House. Uh, and as, of course, the years have gone on, it's the 30th year, it's now Resource Health, and Lana's going to really share a lot of the things that, to me, will make your morning very meaningful in the Lord. You realize that uh, there's some people on the front lines getting the work of the gospel done for the glory of God and for his kingdom, and sometimes we're just not aware of it. But we began to be part of that work, and uh, we're thankful, partnering in prayer, partnering in giving. And one of the areas, of course, is their baby bottle drive. There is a table out in the lobby. Atlanta will be there after, as she was there previously before service. And uh, bottles, grab one, fill it up, put a check in there for a couple thousand dollars or something like that. Put some bills in there. You can always use cash. They don't even need your ID for the cash as long as it's uh, real money and not something that you printed. Fill it up with coins. Coins are wonderful. They make lots of noise, but it's great. Our family and I, our daughters, we've been doing this for a lot of years, and we just love filling up two or three bottles and being able to be part of it in a small way. There are two different occasions in the past where our ADP Sports Charity Golf Tournament uh, jumped in and raised funds for this particular organization, which, again, is on the front lines, touching the lives of young ladies and young men <clears throat> in a way that really is so very meaningful because when they see people, they're at sometimes their very worst spot of life in a crisis. And if any of you have been in any kind of crisis ever, you know that having someone that would be there for you and that would care about you and pray for you, and especially as a person who's lost, just really not knowing what to do. So this is our first Sunday in uh, our 2022 year, we kick off the year with being involved in missions as it's part of our heart and our 25th anniversary. As you can see, our 25th anniversary is getting closer and closer by the remodeling of the auditorium. Carpet will be coming in the, the middle to the end of March. As we uh, progress toward that, we'll be having our uh, dinner theater here in a few weeks. But again, this is our first launching spot for missions this year. Next week is missions on Sunday, and uh, Pastor Randy will be giving us an update on missions and what is going on with all of the missionaries that you support as a church. So missions, of course, is, our, is one of our big things that we do here with missions, family, and sports. Let me just ask one thing real quick. I have one of the handsome ushers in the back of the room is there anybody that does not have one of our schedules or calendar handouts and you'd like one real quick to raise your hand so that you know what's going on here at First Bible? Because again, January is almost gone before you notice the 25th anniversary. Here's one right here that you can make sure that they know what's going on and have a kind of a, a heads up of, hey, we've got some things that are very important to the kingdom of God and for the gospel and we want to make sure that you are abreast of things, but Lana's going to come up here in a moment, but I want you to uh, sit still for a moment and listen to a really tremendous uh, message coming from a video that we have before she comes up and speaks, and really just, just listen to the great message that comes from all those that are speaking in this video. The thought, just the very thought of telling my parents I was pregnant I would much rather have gone through with an abortion in my mind. I was, you know, 18, I was in college, but I remembered the Rachel House. What kept me coming back to Rachel House was 
the non-judgment I felt coming there. It was just like, oh yeah, come back, we'll check on you. And they were checking in on me even after hours. The nurses would text me and they would ask me, well, was I okay? And they follow through with your care. And I've never experienced that before anywhere. I did not think I was going to like the program when I first went into it, but it turned into more, not just a class, but a support system. With this being my first child, I felt like I was gonna be able to um, be all right with things that we learned from the Rachel House classes and the aftercare resources that they still provided. I remember laying on the table being terrified and the lady that did the ultrasound, she got kind of quiet and she said, I'll be right back. So then they came back in and they told me that I was having twins and I remember feeling all the blood rush to my head and I just, I could not believe it. It was quite a shock. It took me a long time to really process that I was actually having twins. So um, after seeing them on the screen, I just decided that I couldn't do it, that I had to keep them, you know, one way or another, I was gonna make this work. I really needed those sonograms when I was going. I had no insurance, I just lost my job. Two older kids, you know, COVID was going on as early into that. So it was a scary time. And uh, without this, I may have just took the easy road out and made a decision that, you know, for the rest of my life, I believe I would have always thought about, man, I did this because I didn't have anywhere to go. If I did not attend the Rachel House classes, I honestly don't think that I would be the father I am today. The things they teach you, the things they talk to you about, the, the relationship you gain, the guidance, the information you get, you can't buy it. My kids have brought so much joy into my family's life. There's a reason that they're here. I am just still so grateful that I chose to walk into Rachel House when I did. My faith in humanity has really gone up, seeing all the um, people who partner with the Rachel House, um, seeing how God really works in those people's lives. My life was greatly impacted by the support that I've had with being a part of Rachel House. And now that I'm on my path and I feel like that I made the right decision, which was to birth Selah, I really believe God put her in my life to restore a lot of broken relationships that I had had. And she's been a focus point and a reason to kind of restore and, you know, get that love back on. So it's been, it's been really good. <laughs> <laughs> she speaks well. Good morning. I'm Lana Yule. Am I on? Yeah? Okay, thank you. I we should have done like a baseball sign or something. Ah. I have to tell you, I usually come to second service and I had no idea what time I was supposed to stop. So I apologize to all oh, you're fine. service people. You're fine. Yeah. So if Brownie starts coughing, I will exit immediately. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'm Lana Yule, and my goal this morning is to celebrate with you. Um, it's a celebration of Life Sunday. I have some really exciting things to share, um, but also some updates. Some of you may be very familiar with Rachel House or very new, so hopefully I'll cover some of those questions for you. Um, but the first one, I won't delay any time at all in telling you why did we change our name. That's usually <laughs> the number one question I get, so here you go. So. For 30 years, since 1992, we have been Rachel House. We actually started in a literal house in Blue Springs, Missouri, and we have grown exponentially in the last 30 years. Um, myself, I've been with Rachel House since 2012, so this is my 10th year of service. But um, for about the last two years, our leadership team was really trying to evaluate not just our branding um, and our logo, but how we present ourselves to the people that we serve. And we really wanted our name to reflect what we do in the community. And so um, we were starting to have this question with ourselves. Um, what does Rachel House, with this big flower, 
represent to the community. Um, it was very um, impactful here even 20 years ago when primarily we were seeing young teenagers and early 20s single moms. But we have grown a lot since then and we have a lot of men in our centers. So Rachel was very feminine, the flower was very feminine, and the house was a little confusing. So our tongue-in-cheek answer is our clients don't know Rachel and they're not looking for a house. So we ended up with the new name Resource Health Services. Chuck actually, after service, he said, oh, it's still the RH, I see what you did there. So we're still RH, um, that's our new logo, but the, the reason for our new name is just simply this. We really wanted to reflect what we do to our clients. And so resources is the number one piece of that. I think you'll see this as I talk over the next 15 minutes, but um, abortion in our nation primarily is a resource issue. A lot of people are seeking abortion as a solution to a real crisis in their lives, but often it's something simple like, I can't feed my two-year-old. I can't imagine what it would be like to feed another newborn. Or I can't afford a car seat that fits my children. Maybe I can't have a child. These are the things people are grappling with in our community. So resources is one of the main things we end up doing. Health is, again, strategic. There's physical health, spiritual health, relational health. Our goal is to really impact the entire family unit, not just the women in the family. And then services. Um, all of the people on our team are believers, and we really do seek to serve our clients um, at the moment of their need. So that's our new name. Like I said, my name's um, Lana Yule. I'm a nurse, and um, my my education is not in nursing only, but also in nursing education. So I didn't know exactly what that was gonna look like when I was going through graduate school, but I love to teach. And it's been a really exciting um, thing over the last several years since my husband and I had our two little girls. I had been an advocate first, and then I moved into the ultrasound nurse role, and then I was managing our city center location, and then, um, we just saw as we've expanded not only our services and our locations, but our staff has just multiplied. So we really needed someone to kind of head up keeping us all on the same page. So my role at Resource Health right now is as the nursing administrator. So I do a lot of things on the back end, but one of my favorite parts of that is I still am the sub nurse. So if anyone's sick for the day or there's vacations and things, I still um, am very close to our clients and I love to still get to see them and be in all of our locations at some point throughout my week. So that is us, Resource Health Services. So Brownie asked me to share just quickly, how did I get started in this area? Um, so when I was back in college, I was very aware of the fact that I was brand new to being an adult, and I had no idea what that looked like. Um, and partnered with that, I was a Christian. And I wanted so badly to make good decisions as I was just getting started in life. Where am I gonna live? Where am I gonna go to school? What am I gonna do for a career? All of these things that everyone thinks through when they're a young adult. And as I was in that college age, I, I read often in the Gospels because I wanted to see what Jesus did. And this concept kept striking me over and over again over the course of several years. But um, you see often, Jesus sees the multitude, or he looked on the person, he saw. You see this very often in um, accounts of his life. But then this other phrase would stick out to me, and usually it was paired with his seeing of the multitudes. It says he was moved with compassion. And as I was just spending time with the Lord and praying through what is nursing going to look like for the long term, God, how can I see the multitudes and how can I move with compassion? And um, when I was younger, I thought multitudes were in Africa or um, on, the, on the streets of California. They, multitudes seemed kind of a distant idea. Um, but as Brownie mentioned, there was a lady in our church congregation about 15 years ago. She'd been praying, God, can you teach me how to be better at sharing the gospel with people in my community? And through that process, she got involved in Rachel House and just shared with me what it was and what they did. And so as a young nursing student and then as a new nurse, I really, really wanted to get involved with this because I began to see the multitudes. 
So Matthew 9, 36 is just one of these accounts, but um, speaking of Jesus, it says, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. So here's a number um, you may not know, a lot of people don't, um, 13,000. So um, at Resource Health, we try to stay really current and just aware of what's going on in our communities. Um, so the most recent um, report from the state of Kansas and the state of Missouri, um, it's always delayed by a year, um, statistics-wise, so I don't have the number for 2020 yet, so this is 2019. But for Kansas and Missourians, there were 13,000 abortions in one year's time in 2019. That number strikes me because um, we had our first daughter in 2019, right in the middle of that year. So 13,000 abortions in our local community, and a, a huge percentage of those happened in the Kansas City area. 13,000 abortions doesn't just reflect 13,000 children. That number reflects 26,000 mothers and fathers who do not have a child today. And that number reflects 52,000 grandparents that do not have a two-year-old grandchild today. This is only one year's time. This happens year after year after year. And so as a young nurse, I became aware of this thing that no one talks about. It's, you're not going to see that number on the news anytime soon. But I realized that is a multitude of people. And if you're already feeling uncomfortable, I just want to, to let you know, I know this is an uncomfortable topic. And you know this is a very personal topic for a lot of people, even in this room. But that's a multitude we can't close our eyes to. As believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, this is our community. These are people we shop at the grocery store with. These are people we drive with on the same streets. These are people that we know their language. We know their culture. We know these people. These are our people. These are us. So we have to move with compassion. And so as Resource Health, I'll, I'll go through a lot of changes and updates, but our goal is always how can we be reaching the multitudes with compassion like Christ did. So I'll just read to you that simple statement there. I don't know if you can read it. Sorry if it's a little too small, but it says, Resource Health Services exist to offer compassionate care to men and women experiencing an unplanned pregnancy. Our focus is to holistically empower the family unit through advocacy, education, mentoring, and discipleship. Our goal is to positively impact families now and for generations to come. So I'll just give you a little um, brief history of us. Our locations have grown a lot. So we have four active centers right now. We have one up in the Northland off Vivian Road. And then we have an Independence location. Both our Northland and our Independence locations um, were literally next door to Planned Parenthood. Um, Northland got a new manager that he didn't like that idea, so he moved down the block to get away from us. But we end up um, having a lot of people come through our doors just, um, just simply because they're in a crisis. They saw our sign, and everything we do is free. So... Um, City Center is our next location. It is off Blue Parkway. Um, I think they're renaming it, though, to Martin Luther King Drive, but it's over by Swope Health, if you know that area. And then Lee Summit is just down off of 291 here close. So we are very, very close. This year we will be opening another center, a fifth center, in the Grandview area, just right off the Grandview Triangle, off of Redbridge Road. Um, and then we've also been pretty aggressively approached by a lot of people in, on the side asking us to open a location in Johnson County so um, that's also on our radar so we've grown a lot um, and it's been pretty exciting stuff um, I'll kind of talk you through just what we do what we offer again I said all of our services are free to our clients um, and some of this people know very well and some of them they don't so I'll kind of talk you through just starting with that white box advocacy piece um, what we do is just talk with people one-on-one. -on -one. We really want to be a non-threatening place to come. Um, everything we do is private, and um, we are available. Anytime our center is open, there will be a man and a woman present um, and a whole team of people that will be available to meet one-on-one. -on -one. 
I'll mention this now, but um, we had our second daughter back in August of last year, and going through pregnancy during COVID was a little weird. Um, there were a lot of rules at the hospital, and so some of my appointments, just for my regular checkups, I would have to check what the rule was for that week or that month, whether or not um, I could bring a visitor. So my husband, Nathaniel, he actually met our daughter for the first time on his phone because he wasn't allowed to come that day for my ultrasound. So our very first ultrasound, I had my phone out <laughs> so he could see. Um, but I share that because of this. In our culture today, we still have a tendency to treat fathers as the mother's visitor. And at Resource Health, we could not disagree more. <laughs> Um, we really want to engage men as fathers, and they are, are given the dignity and the honor of being served just as much as the women that come through our doors. So um, it's, it's quite interesting at times, but like I said, we have a staff person, at least one man at every center, every time we're open. And so often, if a couple comes together, you'll see the guy immediately walk over to the chair as she walks up to the desk to check in, and he grabs out his phone because he figures he's going to be here fiddling for the next hour, you know, as she gets help. Um, but instead, we engage with him, and one of our staff members, um, one of our men, goes and says, hey, can, can we talk as well? And they're just like, oh, sure, you know? So our fatherhood um, classes and services are pretty exciting, but I'll try to explain a little bit more about that as we go along. So advocacy, um, we really do want to just meet with people wherever they are. If that means they simply need a Medicaid form, or they don't know where the closest OB office is, or they are literally in crisis and they need a home tonight, um, we just want to be available to meet with them um, and address those needs. Secondly, we do ultrasound, and that's at all of our locations. We always have at least um, one, if not two, nurses present. Um, and so we just want the ability to show people their children and to talk through their health and what does pregnancy look like and prenatal care and all of these things. And then resources and referrals. As I mentioned, often people are grappling with real needs, real urgent needs and tangible needs. And in the Kansas City metro area, we have incredible amounts of resources for people. If you need food, shelter, clothing, if you need a crib, um, if you're wanting education, parenting skills, there is something available for you. Often people just don't know those things exist. Um, and then education. This is a pretty neat thing we do, but for those that want to get involved, we have an education program for women and for men. And so um, some of our guys, it's the coolest thing. Um, I, I can't even tell you how exciting this is for a lot of our women. If their boyfriend or their husband comes to them and says, you know, I'm not gonna be available for the next four Tuesdays. I'm gonna go take a class about how to be a better father. Those women are just blown away. It's amazing, and these guys are amazing. Some of them we may never see um, the mom in the picture, because no one else in Kansas City is offering fatherhood specifically. And so we want to be available for men, not just women. And so we have these classes, and they go through um, that pregnancy piece. So what does it look like to be a new mom or a dad? Maybe you already have other children in the home, and you feel like you're not doing a very good job. We just want to be available in a classroom setting, in a one-on-one -on -one setting, to be able to walk them through this as they're expecting their new little one. And then mentoring. Here at First Bible, we would call this discipleship, but it's just a one-on-one -on -one relationship long-term after baby's born to continue that. And um, again, as I said, as believers, we really want to see the family unit be in a place of health. And we know that that means spiritual health, um, that marriage isn't an ancient idea that's just so old school and it doesn't matter. Um, committed relationships don't matter. These things matter. And often we have young men and women that come to us saying, can I continue to grow in this? I want to continue to learn. Maybe I need job skills, whatever that looks like. So that's our mentoring piece. Now that little blue box, um, sorry, I'll go there. Often a lot of people haven't thought about STDs since like high school health class decades ago. 
Um, it's not a very popular topic, but we um, started back in July, we started a new um, STD testing and treatment clinic, and this is again at all of our locations. We have seen a lot of people in just six months time, and it's grown exponentially. So our goal with this is not just to um, do STD testing and treatment, but um, we really want, again, to have conversations, the ability to share the gospel with people, the ability to answer those tough questions. Often, people are only going to this for answers. And I don't know about you, but if you Google um, some of your questions when it comes to sex, you're not going to get a very good answer, not a biblical one at the very least. Um, so generally speaking, we just want to be available for those one-on-one, -on -one, very vulnerable times for people um, to be a safe place for them. Um, some of our teenagers, the entire conversation about sex at their house went something like, don't you dare ever come home pregnant, period. And then you end up with a young lady, just like you saw in the video, scared to death to look her dad in the face. And they make some really extreme choices out of fear. And that's not to shame us, but just to say, as a staff, we really wanted to have meaningful conversations. Um, I've been an ER nurse for um, nine years of my career, and as much as I love to be available, if you're bleeding and you need emergency care, great. However, if I could have prevented you from falling off the building 24 hours prior, I would have done that. You know, that would have been my preference. And so in the same way at Resource Health, um, we would love to have these conversations before a crisis pregnancy is even the main issue today. And so just being a safe place for people to come and ask questions. Um, I think you see that, but there's conversation pieces at every point on those services. But um, it's pretty exciting because as believers, we know these are really vulnerable moments for men and women. Um, especially your first child, you feel really uncomfortable and nervous whether you were planning this pregnancy or not, but especially if there's all these other factors on the table. It just feels vulnerable for people. So we want to be a safe place that they can go for honest answers. So I'll just highlight this quickly, but um, our Dads Matter program has been very cool. Um, we have a fatherhood director who's over all of our centers, but we have a staff member that's a man at every center, and their goal is just to meet with those guys one-on-one. -on -one. And then we also do classes, um, and they end up really forming like Hugh said um, in the video, just kind of a support group. Some of our um, clients end up being really good friends. Their, their kids hang out um, for years later, and it's just a neat atmosphere. But we want to be the experts, the people that um, you go to if you are like, hey, I want to be a better dad. Well, the hospital doesn't offer that class. The doctor's office doesn't offer that class. We do, so come to us. We would love to meet with you. So our Dads Matter is pretty cool. I'll read you a couple of statistics, but it, this probably won't surprise you by any means. But kids who have a dad actively involved in their life, they have been shown to be better able to control their emotions. They have better physical health overall. They're healthier in their relationships lifelong. They feel more safe and confident. They're less likely to use and abuse drugs and alcohol. They do better in school. They are less likely to be impoverished in their lifetime. And they're more likely to stay out of trouble. So dads really do matter. And some of our guys that come through our fatherhood program literally come to our, um, our men that teach the classes and they'll say, you know, you're actually the closest thing to a dad I have ever had. So some of these guys are trying to do something they've never actually seen played out in their own lives. They might not have had a father, or they might have had a very unhealthy fatherhood relationship themselves. So I'll finish with this, but um, First Bible has partnered with us for about eight years now, and so I want you to know what you've been a part of. These are just raw numbers, but they're pretty exciting ones. So. Um, again, with COVID, it changed a lot of things. So over the last two years, um, at times, we were functioning with 50% of our staff and volunteers, or two out of our four centers had to be closed for a certain amount of time. So we really worked hard to stay above bar with all the different rules and the changing things that have been going on. Um, just so that we could continue to serve and not have to close our doors. So for 2020 and 2021, 
we were able to do 4,043 pregnancy tests. That means at least 4,043 conversations, one-on-one -on -one with people. Sometimes they had been trying for years and they just couldn't believe they were pregnant, finally. Sometimes people that were totally terrified and had just taken a test at home that morning and they immediately ran through our door. Sometimes people who were trying to go to an abortion clinic because they're so scared and they accidentally walk through our door instead. We just see the gamut. And we see everyone from preteens to 70-year-olds. No exaggeration there. Um, so our STD testing, um, we've already, in just six months' time, we've had 377 people. Again, sometimes those aren't people we would ever see otherwise. About 86% of our clients are at or below the poverty line. That really means there's a lot of people in our community we don't see very often, um, but they're coming through our door for STD testing. Um, the, the whole pandemic has really put a burden on um, STD clinics specifically because the health um, community is just overwhelmed with other testing. And so the PCR tests that run a lot of these STD tests have been used for COVID. And the local health department is unavailable because they're already swamped with other places or other um, things going on. And so there's a lot of people in our community that have nowhere to go. And so um, we want to be available for them. Um, when it comes to education, we've seen um, 11,000 women for education in the last two years and 423 men. Um, I will say this, last year we were so excited because we had nine active um, fatherhood classes going on. This year we're slated to run at least 38 fatherhood classes. So we have really grown um, and so we expect those numbers to continue to increase, not for the sake of numbers, but for the sake of that's hundreds and thousands of people in our community that really are looking for and needing service in this area. Um, our fatherhood visits, we had 660 in the last two years. We did 2,400 ultrasounds, it's a lot of ultrasounds. And um, our mentoring churches, we have 12 churches in our community that are strategically placed around each of our locations that we can partner with because our goal is not just to share the gospel and get you through this crisis. We want to see you get to a place of health and growth and um, and freedom in Christ. And so we really want to be able to partner with the local church and get people in a healthy church body. Um, I don't know if Ginger Gonzalez is in here, but I told her I would probably use her as an example. There's a lot of moms and dads in our community that don't have a Ginger Gonzalez who is going to arrange for the church family to deliver meals when their baby's born. That sounds so simple, but there are a lot of people in Kansas City that do not have a healthy community around them, whether that's family, friends, or a church group. And so we want to get them plugged into the local church. Um, those were the big ones. But um, my favorite number, I'll, I always save this for last, but in the last two years, we've been able to share the gospel 3,430 times. Um, thank you. <laughs> and that's not to mention all the Bibles we've been able to hand out, the Bible studies, the one-on-one -on -one just growth that's happened with a lot of our clients. Um, some of our clients are Christians already, and they've made a really big decision to come and grow more and to make changes in their lives. And so we want to walk them through that. Um, I've had clients that at the end of their visit with me and we've had a conversation, I said, wow, you've shared a lot. Do you mind if I just pray with you before you leave? Their eyes will just, just pop open and sometimes the tears start streaming. I've had women look me in the face and said, no one has ever prayed for me, ever. We have to do this. Sometimes I'd rather not share stories because all the people in that video I have met with one of the people in that video, I did their ultrasound, and they told me at the end of their visit with me, you know what, thank you so much. I have an abortion scheduled in the morning. So 
this is a weighty thing. And again, I, I recognize if you're sitting here thinking, gosh, if I knew this is what we were talking about this morning, I would not have come. I want you to know there's freedom from secrecy and shame. And I know this goes deep for a lot of people. So I would end here. Will you partner with us this year? We need your prayers. There's a group of people that meets um, at our administration building every other Wednesday, and they just simply pray. And we are so grateful. If you would just simply write down on your calendar or your Google Notes every Monday morning, I'm going to wake up and, and pray for Resource Health that this week would go well. Please do that. Um, our staff and volunteers have picked a serious fight. <laughs> You can probably hear it, but there's a lot of spiritual warfare that goes, um, goes along with this issue. This is a life and death issue, not just for these children, but for their families. And there's a lot of hurting people. Um, I've met with a lot of men and women who had an abortion 5, 10, 15 years ago, two weeks ago, and they're so broken and they're so hurt. But they're told that their grief is not valid because it's no big deal. And they did something empowering, and that they had the freedom of choice to do. And they're in so much pain, and they don't know where to go. But we have hope, and we have the truth, and we can help people walk through that and get to a place of healing through Jesus Christ. It's January, and we, as a community, a lot of people go to church at Christmas time, and they have a nice a nice service, and there's candlelight, and it feels really cushy, and, you know, little baby Jesus was in a manger at the front, and they walk out the door, and they have no idea what Jesus Christ means to anything. It, there's no connection there. It's like, what does that have to do with my sex life, or my family, or whether or not I take this job or that job? There's, so there's a lot of people that have heard about Jesus, but they've never heard the gospel, and we have this awesome opportunity to share that with them. So again, please pray for us. Pray for our clients. Um, you probably have a lot of people I will never impact. Let people know what we do, where we are. If your neighbor is complaining about her teenager this week, you can give them our phone number. Um, we are available. Um, please give. We need money to do what we do. And um, there's a lot of ways to even do material donations. A lot of people donate new baby clothes or cribs or pack and plays. There's all kinds of things. So you'll see that out on the table if you want to give. Um, with the expansion to one and then another um, center, we're going to need more people. So if you would like to serve with us. Um, but really our goal as, as believers is we want to move with compassion not close our eyes to the multitude that's right in front of us and at our workplaces and in our in our homes um so thank you so much for allowing me to share with you i appreciate it celebration of life that's tremendous uh, lana thank you again for doing um, a Holy Spirit directed and led presentation <clears throat> to make us not just aware, but to maybe shake us to the core of the reality that we see multitudes but do not move with compassion. We see people around us that have a need for the gospel, period. We see people hurting desperately. And uh, Jesus is our model, I heard. I heard that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by him, that we are to act, live, to walk out, be focused, purposed, and care like he does. Well, go study the Gospels. Lana will tell you that one of the parts of her journey in landing in Rachel House, formerly, now Resource Health, is that she began to look at the life of Jesus Christ through the Gospels and how he acted, moved, and dealt with needs. And so this is our 
Celebration of Life Sunday, go to 1 John chapter number, number 2. I'm going to just uh, by the Spirit of God add a little something to this because the profound message already is clear that there are people on the front lines doing the work of the gospel just as many of you are, but many of you are not. Many of you are missing what God would have you to do through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, after he did what he did for you in changing your life. And in 1 John chapter number 2, you see verse number 1 speaking of an advocate. We have an advocate. Really complicated title. Ah, it's in the scripture. That's our highlight. We have an advocate. Today we celebrate life, the life that the giver of life gave us at birth, but also the new life the Father gave us through his Son, Jesus Christ. 1 John 2, 1 says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Our, our theme verse of our short little message this morning that comes alongside and prayerfully adds to the message of the celebration of life very simply says this, the advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ, directed by the Father, came and said, okay, I'm going to represent heaven, I'm going to represent you, and I'm going to act according to my Father's will and as Jesus Christ, the righteous, he became the advocate to deal with our sin, we have an advocate. I think sometimes we just somehow, some way, have, a, have this uh, short-term memory loss. Thought you'd like that. Short-term memory, just wait a minute, but I think it's a long-term memory loss that his advocacy for us if you went to the website of Resource Health, and by the way, it was part of their mission statement, it says, we are your team, on your team, we trust, empower, advocate, and mentor. It's one of their four core pieces and pillars of their ministry and their programming. Your health and well-being are number one priority, which then walks you right into this place of, wow, I need an advocate. I need somebody to stand there for me. Well, spiritually speaking, you have an advocate. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. He acts at the right hand of the Father without your being here while you have an advocate, the Holy Spirit. And if you look into your Strong's Concordance and find that the only place the word advocate, right here, the advocate is in your New Testament right there, 1 John 2, 1, you also see when you look it up in the Strong's that it relates to the Comforter, found in John 14, 15 throughout. And you say, ah, the Comforter of the Holy Spirit. Well, he is the advocate within. You have an advocate, yes, Jesus Christ, for your sin and for so much more. And that's really our, 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 really our theme of our simple message this morning. We need advocates. We need people to intercede and to serve others as a picture of and a model of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter number 2, I want to read six verses down. We'll take these six verses, break them down, and again, be done quickly as a supplement to the message of the celebration of life day today at First Bible Baptist Church. Verse 1 again, 1 John chapter number 2, my little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, verse 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins. He's the atonement. He is the atoning payment, and not for yours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I love that word, propitiation. That's Jesus Christ. He propitiated for our sins. He is the once and for all sacrifice, the atonement. Verse 3, and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Verse 5 and 6, but whoso keepeth his word, 
In him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Notice real quick, verse 5, it says, But whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God. Hereby know we that we are in him. The phrase in him, very powerful in him, because verse 6 says, He that saith he abideth in him. It works both ways. Are we in him? The advocate puts us in him, but also to he says, I am in you. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Jesus Christ is our advocate. We have an advocate, but the advocate means so much, so much. The word advocate and what it means in its office, in its character, in the fact that Jesus Christ is called amongst many character traits and names that are attributed to him, advocate. Who is this advocate, Jesus the righteous? Well, I've got three simple slides for you to grab a handle on it. Again, from your Strong's Concordance, G3875. The first one up on the screen, one who pleads another cause before a judge, a pleader. Wouldn't you like to know that Jesus Christ will plead your case before the judge? Yeah, you ought to, because a believer has him as your advocate to plead that there's no judgment upon you and no condemnation on you. Is that a good thing? You believing on the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior means the advocate will plead that you are in him before the Father. Bam. You're done. There's no judgment, no condemnation. You will not face that. He is the one who pleads before the judge. He's a pleader. Number two, when you see up on the screen, you say, okay, that goes a little further. One who pleads another one's cause, an intercessor. He intercedes for you. You need no other. In the Old Testament, they had to sacrifice anew and sacrifice anew, sacrifice anew. The high priest had to have the priest and the high priest had to come. Jesus Christ, he propitiated for your sins. There's no more need for any more advocacy. He is the advocate. There's no more sacrifices needed. He is the once and forever. He was the better, as Hebrews teaches us. He's the intercessor now. He intercedes on your behalf and my behalf, believer. If you're lost today, you need the advocate. You need him to be the one that's going to take care of things as your pleader. You're going to need him and want him today as your intercessor. And in the widest sense... He's a helper, a succour, says up there. He is an aider, an assistant to succour. That word you can find in your Bible. It means very simply it's a synonym of help. Let me reiterate. Jesus Christ is your advocate without, which means as you and I think as believers, Jesus our advocate, he's at the right hand of the Father. But he is that one in heaven that advocates for you because you are in him. Holy Spirit, in the believer, he advocates for you. He's the comforter. The same word, advocate, translated in the meaning of it in English from the Greek shows us, again, comforter. Jesus Christ is our advocate. We have an advocate. Well, what are we going to do with this? Five minutes and I'm done. Watch this. Three simple slides off of here that bring it really simply and practically as Jesus is our advocate. Number one, our advocate deals with sin for us. Okay? Do you know that the book of Romans deals with this in a beautiful way? If you go over to Romans 6, and I mention this every once in a while, where would we be without some of these incredible chapters? Chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8. Chapter 6 very simply says this. You do not need to sin anymore, believer. You say, well, you're saying I need to be sinless. I did not say that. I said you do not need to sin. God forbid. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ in your life as a believer puts you in a position where the advocate has dealt with sin for you. You now can have a propensity and a draw and a desire for the word of God. How is it that we somehow go, eh, I want to 
meet my flesh's need and be drawn to that. He says, no, 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 no. The advocate upon you and me says, hey, your sin is taken care of. You no longer have to live in this idolatrous, idolatrous fashion bound to sin. So, you as a believer know all that. Would you do that for someone else and advocate for them? You say, I'm gonna, you're saying that I can wash away people's sins. No, 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 I didn't say that. I said, could you be an aid and a help and a succor to a lost person? Tell them, there is someone named Jesus that I'm going to tell you about that can deal with your sin for you. Why would we not do that? Church, we're missing the boat so often. These people are on the front lines. It's an example. They're just an example. We're not raising them on a pedestal as to be our idols or our icons or, oh, they do it better than anyone else. I didn't say that. Atlanta did not say that. She humbly stood before you and said, God has put her in a position where she is an advocate, a servant, a mentor, an overseer. She's got more letters after her name than, I don't even have a degree for crying out loud. She's awesome but awesome in Jesus. Jesus is awesome in her, and she's saying, hey, you know what? The advocate dealt with sin for me. Would you, would I be willing to deal with that in someone else? Oh, you don't like the messy stuff. Well, aren't you glad somebody loved your messy stuff when they led you to Jesus Christ? Somebody liked your messy stuff enough to look beyond your messy stuff to be an advocate. The second thing the advocate does is this. The advocate proves faith in us. Look at verse number three. The advocate, Jesus Christ, put a bunch of commandments before his disciples, even more so than even the whole word of God, the, the law, the schoolmaster. He says in verse number three, John the apostle, and hereby we do know that we know him, who? The advocate through the, excuse me, the father through the advocate, Jesus Christ, so we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. You say you're born again. You say you're a believer. You say you have a faith walk. You believe in the faith that God has put in you, that you enacted, and for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I know Jesus. I love Jesus. I believe in Jesus. He is my Savior. He is my Lord. Then, what does your faith look like? It's easy to teach the little kids in a Sunday school class or in a Awanas or something like that. Obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. Remember that one? None of you? Some of you? It would probably, my voice ruined the song. But obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. Action is the key to immediately. I mean, very simple. Our advocate proves faith in us. He proves it in you and me. He spent John 13, 14, 15, 16. You hear me say this every once in a while. Again, I did a short series on it years ago, The Last Conversations of Jesus. And he listed commandments. And the ones that are most profound is love like I loved. Greater love hath no man than this. They lay down his life for his friends. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. Today I give you a new commandment, he says. I give you a new commandment. That you love. As I love. Well, what about those commandments? The advocate proves you and me to be faithful. The advocate's the one proving our faith. Do you let him do that? And when you do that, would you be willing to do that for someone else who's having a tough go of it in their walk? So transport your thinking in mentorship and discipleship and being in people's lives and having a Bible study. Would you come alongside of someone, someone else, and be their advocate in their faith walk? Because that's what the advocate does. He's advocating for you and for me, his advocacy. What is resource health services doing? They're advocating, and they're showing that, hey, I'm putting my life where my mouth said I would do it. I'm saying my actions match my faith. I'm saying I'm there. By faith, Abraham, in Hebrews chapter number 11, verse 8, when he was called to go out of the place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whether he went. Hebrews 11:8. 8. That's Father Abraham 
who have any sons. You didn't know I was going to do a little singing today for you. Here we go. Last one. Our advocate models love to us. Look at verses 5 and 6. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected, completed, finished. His love is perfected in us. The advocate says, I'll model love for you in the more you give me, in the more you give me of you. I will sanctify you, and then I'll get more of you, and I'll get more of you. And I will model this love in you that I've talked about. My father's love that I spoke about to the disciples, I've modeled it to you. I prayed for you in John 17. I love you so much, and I've modeled my love out to you, disciples. Even when they chose not to walk with him anymore in John 6, so many of them. So here it is for you and me. Would you do so for someone else? To model the love. That the advocate models to you. It's a simple message, but it's very profound what goes on in these first six verses. Because if you keep his word, verily is the love of God perfected, finished, and completed in you. Hereby know we what we are in him, verse 6. Says, he that saith he abideth in him, lives in him, walks in him, resides in him, ought himself also. So to walk, even as he walked. Those people that walk through the front doors of Resource Health have never seen Jesus Christ. None of you have ever seen him. Jesus spoke of that. Any of you ever seen him? No. But how will you see him? But as the advocate has modeled his love in your life, you model it for someone else who never, ever, ever has seen or heard of or had it modeled in their lives. That is a life changing, defining moment in that person's life. I will never forget Mike Metzger. Ever. Never. He comes to my mind every time that man modeled the advocate's love in him to me. And that changed my life. So we end with this thought. Where would you and I be without him? Where would you be without the advocacy of Jesus? Where would we be? Where would we be? You wouldn't have the life you have. I wouldn't have the life. You wouldn't have the life, Ashley. Doc, you wouldn't have the life. Steve, John, you wouldn't have the life you have. You and I, where would we be? That question should be asked almost every day. Lana stood up here and said, I... I don't know what greater work would God have me to do than this because some of these women and men, they don't know where they'd be. So I ask you this question today in our invitation. This is for you. Today, would you begin to be an advocate for someone else? See, Lana's message was simply about everyone else but her pointing to the God of glory. And everything that I've had to say for just a few minutes has pointed to the advocate that you and I have in Jesus Christ. Maybe today is a beginning point for you to advocate for someone in prayer. You can start doing that today. Bow your heads for a word of prayer. I'll pray with you. We'll play some music in the background and we'll have our invitation hymn, invitation song here. Our Father.